crisis. LBC also understands government officials have discussed using temporary classrooms for up to five years, which the Department for Education has refused to rule out. Labour's Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer and MP for Leeds West, Rachel Reeves, says her party would deal with matters differently. Labour's school building programme built a new sixth form block at my school and it made a massive difference. So I know the difference that modern, good quality buildings make. I want to ensure deal problem we're confronted with today so that kids can get back to school. 19 schools have had to delay the start of the term while four of those have reverted to remote learning over safety concerns. Airports and ports have been alerted after a terror suspect escaped from prison this morning. Former soldier Daniel Abed Khalif, who's 21, had been awaiting trial at HMP Wandsworth. Staff at 140 universities across the UK will walk out for five days later this month. Members at the University College Union will strike in a dispute over pay and working conditions from the 25th. And today's been the hottest September since 2016. The Met Office says it got up to 32 degrees. LBC market report the FTSE 100s closed down 11 points at 74.26 the pound buys $1.24 and one euro 16. LBC where they're staying mostly dry still low of nine. From Global's newsroom for LBC I'm Serena Farrow. This is LBC from Global leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's one minute past eight on LBC. Welcome to Wednesday's Cross Question. On the panel with me tonight, to my left, Leila Moran, Liberal Democrat MP for Oxford West and Abingdon. She speaks for the party on foreign affairs and international development. Next to her, uh, making his debut on the show, which I'm slightly horrified at. I don't know why we haven't had you on before. Greg Hans, Conservative Party Chairman and MP for Chelsea and Fulham. Uh, To my right, Dr Charlotte Proudman. She's a veteran of the programme, if I can use that word. Uh, Human Rights Barrister. She's the director of Right to Equality and Dan Hodges, another veteran of the programme is a columnist for The Mail on Sunday so the number to call if you'd like to put a question to our panel 0345 6060 973 you can text 84850 and of course you can say Alexa, send a comment to LBC and put your question that way and of course you can watch the whole hour on Global Player Call 0345 6060 973 Tweet at LBC Text 84 84- 850 Cross Question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. I'm sure you don't need any hints about what to ask. You can ask about what you like, but you might want to ask about Rishi Sunak denying that he hasn't taken the school's concrete issue seriously when he was Chancellor. Uh, charities have hit out at a move to make successful asylum seekers leave the government-funded hotels within seven days rather than 28. And a Red Wall Tory MP calls for a Minister for Men to be created. I'd quite like to hear Charlotte Proudman's views on that one, so I hope that somebody's going to ask that, and we're going to be talking about that after nine on the programme as well. So let's go to our first question. It's a text question from Jenny in Blackpool. Does the panel think the government has acted decisively about the concrete in schools issue? Leila. I try and put myself in the position of people who have to make these decisions, and I look at what I know. What I don't understand is how when they had that first school that had the problem in 2018, there wasn't that precautionary measure taken at that point. Not least because in the interim period, we had the pandemic where lots of kids weren't in school. There was time to do work like that. There was an opportunity to do remedial work. And we remember how construction workers were allowed to work. So they could have done it then. I think the timing of it has been awful. And Parents and students going back first week back, many of them first day at school. For some of them, they've already had huge disruption. Uh, I've got a school in my constituency that uh, has been told it might have rack. It put the survey back into the inbox of the Department for Education on the 14th of July. They have yet to hear from the department but at all. if they all. think they might have it, why wouldn't they have automatically got someone to check if they had? They, why would that be the responsibility of the government? Because, well, at that point, they didn't know. So they were waiting on the new guidance. They didn't hear on Friday last week what to do. They didn't hear on Monday. I had to raise it in the house today. And what's happened as a precautionary measure based on the guidance is half the school is closed. So 20 classes are out of commission. Years 7, 8 and 9 are on rotation. And quite rightly, parents and students are very upset. And the teachers coming to me going, her teacher saying, please help me work out what we're meant to do because it's 
not as decisive. So the government's doing, I think, a very bad job of convincing people they're on top of this. They absolutely aren't. And the question I had for Gillian Keegan today is how many other schools are in this position? The reason they can't put in porter cabins and procure all of this stuff is because they don't yet know if they even need it. So they had this timeline that they say, oh, we're doing this quickly, but actually the timing's awful. And the short answer to the question is, I don't think they have been decisive enough insofar as they should have done this earlier. It's interesting how you started your answer there. So you try and put yourself in the position of the minister, which I I think probably everybody should do from time to time. Um, But of course, the timing on this sort of thing, whenever you do it, it's never going to be good, is it? No. And I I don't know this. I haven't spoken to Gillian Keegan about it. it, I got the impression that she, the timing has been dictated by the fact that she thought, well, I can't leave this. If if there is something that goes wrong, we're inevitably going to be blamed. So let's get in now, even though it is going to be quite disruptive to a lot of schools. Although, I mean, given the, the I mean, it's what, 134, I think. Yeah, so although it's far, 600 there will be that more. were identified in the initial tranche. And uh, as of <coughs> Friday, and I'm sure the number's higher now, only half have had those surveys done. So they're now scrambling. Um, to be fair to Gillian, we've had, is it nine education secretaries over the course of this parliament? I mean, the part of what's happening here is the general sense of chaos in the Conservative Party, the lack of continuity in these key roles. And I do think whilst they're mishandling it now, and I do think a bit of humility and yes, maybe we haven't got this perfectly right. Yes, there's a lot of detail she does know, but there's also potentially some information missing as my example school shows. Uh, I think a bit of humility would go a long way right now. Um, Greg Hans, there was no humility in that interview with ITV News, was there? In fact, Gillian Keegan seemed to be wanting congratulations for the way she's handled this. Well, she did uh, apologise for uh, how she uh, ended that interview. Uh, But the most important thing, Ian, is that the government has taken charge. Uh, The most important thing is that pupils return to school in a safe setting and are allowed to carry on with their education. You know, we saw a lot of disruption of education during the pandemic. It's really important that education continues. It's also really important that we don't be alarmist on this, that actually there are 22,000 schools in this country. Uh, The number affected is less than 1%. Of course, that's incredibly important for pupils at those schools. I've got one in my constituency uh, and for parents, but we have to keep it in proportion and recognise that when the situation changed in terms of the information that was available, the Secretary of State, Gillian Keegan, acted quite properly, quickly and decisively and was defended very ably at the dispatch box today by Rishi Sunak during Prime Minister's question time. The most important thing is to make sure uh, that school children can return as quickly as possible to a safe environment, but we need to keep it also in proportion, Ian. This is less than well, 1% of schools enough, but what, when they when they put out social media graphics saying um, most schools are unaffected mm. by this, it's like saying, well, well most, most aircraft don't crash. Oh, isn't it no, no consolation to the, the kids and the parents who are being affected? And, and surely one question that has to be asked is, if this issue was known about, which it clearly was, why why wasn't more done maybe at the beginning of the school holidays? So each school would have six weeks to then maybe get a surveyor in to sort of check what was going on. And we wouldn't be faced with this issue where uh, literally some schools had one day to prepare as to what to do. Well, the information changed, uh, and that is when the government acted, when the information changed. Uh, you're right, Ian, How did you, it change and when did it change? Because the information that came in, for example, from the surveys and some of the evidence, I'm not a, a technician on this, um, but the information changed, and when the information changed, that's when Gillian Keegan and the department acted decisively. You're quite right. That there's no ideal time for this to happen, uh, but nonetheless, it is better that it happened, you know, if you like, when, 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 when schools are actually on holiday. I know we're all back now, and there's no ideal time for this. The most important thing is to get children back into school into a safe environment. I stress that it affects uh, 52 uh, schools have made those uh, mitigation measures. There's 104 known about that are doing mitigation. You know, we're still talking about less than 1% of all schools. And quite a few of these 130 schools are in Essex. I was looking down the list. There's an incredible number in Essex. I don't know why. I was expecting my old school to be there, but it wasn't. Dan Hodges. Um, well, to answer the question, uh, has the government acted decisively? No, but then the governments of all persuasions haven't acted decisively on this issue. I mean, this is an issue that, as we now know, dates back to 1994. 
Um, I think you have to distinguish between what the government's done and what Julian Keegan's done. I, I actually have some sympathy with Julian Keegan in terms of what you know her uh, her sort of exasperation because she's. It seems to me quite clearly she's the first education secretary again of any persuasion who's finally decided to grasp this issue. And I think I do think she deserves some credit for that. Um, but but I think there's a broader issue here. I, I, I don't think you know I, I heard Greg's defence sort of relatively eloquent defence there. Uh, and talking about keeping this in proportion, I think that's right. I don't think we're going to see schools collapsing around the country. But I think there's a broader political uh, element to this. And I, mean, I don't know, uh, I, I, I don't know if you remember back in sort of like the early 90s, there was a, um, there was a hotel in Scarborough that was on, situated on the side of a hill. And it got, it, it, the, the cliff it was sitting on got eroded and eventually the, the hotel collapsed. And it sort of fell into the sea live on 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 breakfast television. And I think about a week later, um, it was either I can't remember what it was. It was like the the the, 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 the Queen's speech debate or something. John Smith went through the and listed when he was Labour leader listed a, a legacy of like sort of current Tory government failings. This, yeah. And he basically uh, Black Wednesday whatever. And he came to the end and he said, "And is it any surprise that you know we?" Under this government, we now live in a country where hotels fall into the sea. I remember, I was, I was actually in the chamber, I was remember in the gallery watching it, and I think it's quite a sort of, it's a silly line because it's not, it's not the government's fault. But it just kind of symbolised mm. something. And this is the problem for Greg and the Conservative Party of this. Like I said, schools aren't going to collapse, we're not going to have hundreds of kid, children killed. It just symbolises, I think, a sense that Britain is falling down. It, there's this, there's the small boats, there's the strikes, there's... And I think that is going to be the lasting legacy of this system. Oh, Greg, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because there, there does seem to be a growing sense that none of our public services are working, that just the basic things that we've all taken for granted, like kids being able to go to school, um, the, the, they seem to be slightly falling apart, so people naturally hold the government responsible for that. Well, no, I, I don't really agree with that narrative, actually. I think a lot of our public services uh, are, are not in perfect shape, but they are improving. Uh, in terms of the actual outputs of schools, for example, as the Prime Minister raised today at Prime Minister's Question Time, actually our test results, uh, particularly in maths, for example, are now some of the best in the Western world. That's been really turned around. Uh, in the last 10 years. So when we look at outputs about what is happening, for example, in our education system, what is happening thanks to the schools reforms uh, introduced by Michael Gove, for example, 10, 12 years ago when we were in coalition. Oh, he, he was the one that abolished the Building Schools for the Future programme. Well, the Building Schools for the Future programme, which was, uh, of course, the, the Liberal Democrat Chief Secretary of the Treasury at the time. But the Building Schools for the Future programme, as the Prime Minister rightly said today, was not good value for money. The National Audit Commission report into the Building Schools for the Future programme, Ed Balls's programme, was not good value for money and didn't produce good outcomes. And that's why the government decided to replace it with a different programme that was much better value for money. So that is, if you like, the history of that issue. The amount of money that's being put into schools' budgets, capital budgets, is on the increase. Uh, the number of schools that are being refurbished is about 50 per annum. That's not a bad rate. Uh, the Prime Minister, so he was accused of cutting that programme. That's not correct. It was not been cut. Uh, but look oh, at the, the Department of Education, of according to Rachel B, she gave us the figures on in the last hour on the programme. Um, the Department of Education has underspent by £1.4 billion pounds on that capital programme over the last four years. Um, now, that you can say, well, that's only a 7% uh, gap. But £1.4 billion pounds could have rebuilt quite a lot of schools. Well, we are rebuilding a lot of schools. Uh, and obviously government departments, having been a Chief Secretary of the Treasury, uh, uh, government departments quite often underspend, overspend each year, one year to the next, and then the underspend okay. of the overspend gets rolled forward. It's not necessarily a big, significant fact. I'm sensing Charlotte sort of pouring <laughs> the ground, wanting to get in. Charlotte, the floor is yours. Um... I don't think it matters whether it's 1% of schools or 0.5% of schools that are affected by this. I think the fact that many parents and children, more importantly, are going to have their education disrupted as a result of the concrete chaos um, after the pandemic and all of the challenges which arose more broadly in the education system is obviously going to have um, a long-term impact upon children in those schools. And I think one of the bigger issues is perhaps how the government handle this now. And I think suggesting, you know, 
seeing a level of humility and an apology, a sincere apology, and also a strategy in terms of a way forward to address this issue is what parents will want to hear. And, I, and I'm afraid I haven't seen that. I haven't seen anything with the strength of character that one may ordinarily want to see from an education secretary, which I think is extremely disappointing. Do you think, though, that maybe school leaders, and I'm not just talking about head teachers here, but school governors uh, as well, need to take a little bit more responsibility themselves? If it was in any other sector, say a hospital, for example, I would expect the chief executive of a hospital to regard it as his or her responsibility to make sure that the buildings were sound. And therefore, every few years, you have a surveyor in to check that that's the case. Why, why is it that schools think that this is entirely the responsibility of central government? Well, I mean, I, I think that's a good question. I, I don't know nearly enough, of course, to comment on that. But uh, from what I'll go I, and have a go. No, well, I mean, <laughs> from what I read um, when I was reading earlier this afternoon, there were some school governors that had suggested they were alive to this issue and had attempted to bring it to the attention of the in quote powers that be to do something about it, and they either hadn't had. A well, response they are the powers back. that be. Well, well, they're there to govern the school. Therefore, yeah, well, they say systemic. to their teacher, bring in a surveyor. We understand it'll cost a couple of thousand well, pounds problem, to do though, so. Isn't it? It's the money and it's the fact it's a systemic problem as well. Okay. Yeah, I was a, I was a school governor um, and was a teacher uh, before I was an MP. We lo always were looking at this kind of thing and the, mm. the, the estate. And actually, most schools, especially now, are carrying... You usually have to do a, a budget for three years. If you can't do a, a balanced budget for three years, you have to sort of go in and do a special budget if you can't. And most schools, a, a lot of schools are now doing that. The school I mentioned is in an in-year deficit. And so when you are in that position, you are scrambling around to work out what is the most urgent thing that needs to happen next. And so unless you have that clear direction from usually the DfE saying that, you know, here's this problem. Yes, it is a problem. We're alerting you to a problem, but you know, we're not forcing you to do it. They they are looking for the boiler. Yeah. They are looking, there are broken windows. We've got schools with water pouring through the roof. You know, they are more sort of immediate in your face. And this rack stuff is insidious. It's sort of in the walls and you've got to have a proper surveyor to come and do it. So some schools were and credit to them, but I'm afraid to say, you know, the governors needed that support and that direction from government and they didn't get well, it. And I think it was 2018 that that should have started to have been happening. But the wider problem around this is actually about the crumbling they, school estate. They sent the email out, I think, uh, sometime in 2022. So schools have had quite a long time. And they must have been alerted to the problem by the, the form that they had to fill in, which not all of them have done. Greg, we've got to move on, but very quickly. Well, I just feel, I mean, the government has taken responsibility uh, and we are waiting for the surveys uh, to come back. Uh, that is the right thing to do, and we are taking action uh, to make sure as quickly and safely uh, that children can return to school. I stress again uh, that uh, it's a small number of schools, but it's really... But there will be the massive, I mean, school. It's not going to it's stay It's massive significance but, for those at those schools. I know from the school in my constituency, a very, very high-profile school with a lot of... Um, uh, with a big school, and I know how important it is, but the government has taken responsibility, has taken charge, and is doing the sensible balance thing in making sure that we get children back as quickly as possible in a safe environment. But in the case of my school, they sent it back at the end of the last term. Mm. That was the summer. The DfE didn't get back to them. And they were waiting for that guidance about what do we do next? Because they filled in a survey. They aren't surveyors themselves. They trusted the department. He was like, OK, we got this. We've sent you the survey. And they didn't get back to them. And now there's this chaos. So, you know, the DfE... I'm afraid to say they, they, they're doing not some stuff. not blaming civil servants, Layla, are you? No, I'm blaming Gillian Keegan, yeah, I'm but Gillian Keegan is not, frankly, not responsible for responding to a survey that went out to 22,000 schools. No, but when you are sending out a survey like that and then it's coming back with a number of schools saying you might have rack, at that point it should be, you can, as a minister, say, right, you get back to them immediately and you get them to do the work over the summer. That was a decision that could have been taken. Well, it'd be quite interesting to know whether she, when she was actually alerted to sort of specifics like that. But we shall never, well, maybe we will know at some point, but we're not going to find out on this programme right now. But we will come to more of your calls and texts in just a moment. It's 19 minutes past eight. LBC.
Bye. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Alexa, send a comment to LBC. 21 minutes past eight on LBC. On the panel tonight, we have the Conservative Party Chairman Greg Hans, uh, Lib Dem Foreign Affairs spokes... You do like spokesperson or spokeswoman? Person. Don't mind, person. Woman. Okay. Leila Moran, uh, Dan Hodges is a columnist for The Mail on Sunday, and Dr Charlotte Prabhan is a human rights barrister. Right, let's go to Mark in Gosport. Hello, Mark. Hi, Ian. Hi, My what question like is, um, does the panel think Greg Hans's continual parading of that letter is clever politics or a crass attempt to deflect the Tories' dreadful handling of the economy and the growth in borrowing? Now, far be it from me to jump to Greg Hans' defence here, but you were referring to his last answer about the schools, were you? Uh, well, no, I wasn't, because I couldn't hear you, because I was... <laughs> no, but that was my... I'm, oh, right. I'm continually looking at Twitter, etc., and, and yeah. Greg Hans sends that letter over Twitter or once a week, twice a week. So this is, um, this is the letter that Liam Byrne left for David Laws exactly. at the Treasury, saying yeah. that there was no There's money no left. Money People are getting annoyed yeah. at this, Greg. Well, actually, it, it illustrates a, a wider point, in my view, which has been a point... Uh, made, if you like, for me by the bankruptcy uh, just at la yesterday of, of Birmingham Council, Europe's largest council. What it shows, Ian, is that when Labour are in charge of things, uh, they run them very badly and they but end you, up you, with no hang money. Hang on a second, hang on a second. You know that the reasons for that bankruptcy are not just to do mm. with Labour's management of that council. And are you, well, they, I think they it stretch largely back. There are Tory they councils that have also been bankrupted. When the Tories were in charge too. Well, it largely yes. relates to uh, 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 legal fees, consultancy fees. It's been a problem. It's been a Labour-run council, I think, for about 10 years. And it illustrates a wider point. Labour runs some quite big authorities in this country. Mm. Like, for example, London. Like, for example, a whole country, Wales. Like, for example, Birmingham. And they've been shown time and time again. This is Labour's real Achilles Who heel. Runs when they run council. something, right. they run it back. Who runs uh, Northamptonshire County Council? Wokingham. Who runs Wokingham These are, but, the, but Birmingham is Europe's largest I know. council. London it's is not just a Labour the thing. country's yeah. largest local authority. Wales is a whole country. These are time and time again. When Labour runs something, they've been shown to run it badly. And Birmingham illustrates that perfectly. But there are plenty of uh, Labour councils that are run perfectly well. Obviously, Birmingham, because it's so big, is headline news. But you can't sit there and pretend that there have been, haven't been Conservative councils that have also had exactly the same problems and have run out of money and have had to declare themselves bankrupt. But, but, but these, these, I'm talking here, of course there other councils as well and I've been around in politics a long time I remember my own council Hammersmith the Fulham the swap scandal in the 1980s 1990s it's been a whole series of local authorities but this is a council Birmingham that has had problems for a long time Keir Starmer put in his own chosen person as Birmingham council leader earlier this year yet still this is a council which is effectively declaring bankruptcy and this plays into a wider point going back to the question about the letter is that Labour have got a long track record of running things badly, running out of other people's money, which was raised with the Prime Minister today at uh, Prime Minister's questions by Nicola Richards. So you must be Nicola. so embarrassed that debt, public debt in this country under a Conservative government is the highest it's ever been. Well, debt is coming back under control, and a lot of that it's, rose it's during the pandemic. Trillion. When you came into power, it was 800 billion. Well, it's coming back under control, and actually when you look at the deficit we inherited in 2010, but the point here is that Labour, and this is really Labour's Achilles heel, Leon, going into next year's election, why people at the moment are not flocking to Keir Starmer is they've got deep suspicions about what a future Labour government would mean so we for running something like more, the government. They see can, how Labour runs London, they see okay. how London, Labour so runs we, Birmingham, Wales. So we can Wales, expect to see more of you brandishing Liam Burns' letter. Well, look, it's been shown, if you don't mind me saying, that actually a lot of people are well aware of that letter and most importantly okay. is what it means the wider significance that Labour run things badly when they're in charge of authority Charlotte I don't think the Conservative Party run things particularly effectively. I mean, if we look, for example, at legal aid and the problems within the justice system, the criminal justice system, the family justice system, it's on its knees. Courts have closed. There's a significant backlog. Rape victims are waiting four, even five years 
for their case to get to trial. Rape has become decriminalised uh, with only uh, less than 2,000 convictions despite one in four women being raped or sexually assaulted. What on earth is the Conservative Party doing about that? The conviction rates have gone down under your leadership. Violence against women and girls is up. I think it's an appalling indictment of the party. Dan? Uh, well, to, again, to ask the question, I mean, is it good politics, is it bad politics? I mean, it's, it's basically the only politics Greg's got now. I mean, I remember turning up at the two uh, the 2015 Tory manifesto launch and the, and, and the letter was literally, like, plastered on the wall. It was part of the, it was part of the backdrop to the launch. Uh, the reality is, I mean, you know, Greg's, uh, again, done, you know, an eloquent attack on, on Labour in Birmingham and elsewhere. But the problem is it, it, it kind of feeds into what we were talking about before. There was a period, and we all remember it, there was a period when the Conservatives came into power where they had, they had, a, they had a good run basically saying, well, I know things aren't working, but it was kind of Labour's fault and we inherited this mess and we're clearing it up. And you can do that for a while as a political party. And you can get, you can get some good mileage out of it and respect to Greg and his party, they have done. But then you cross over and that's what's happened now. And you're now in a point where people say, do you know what? You've been in power 13 years mm. and you're blaming this person, you're blaming that person, you're blaming the other person. We don't care. We elected you. You're the guys in charge. You know, and I, I get why you, I get why you're doing it, Greg. I understand it. It's like this Labour attack line, Labour bankrupt Birmingham. All people are seeing is councils are going bankrupt. Mm. So along with schools collapsing mm. and the trains aren't running and they're not stopping the boats, councils are going bankrupt. And it's all happening on your happening on your watch. And the problem the Tories have got now, especially actually with Rishi Sunak, who is like his pitch is I'm the world's greatest project manager. I'm the guy who, uh, I'm not spin, I'm not, you know, blah, 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 I just get things done. People are no longer gonna accept after 13 years in power, rightly or wrongly, excuses for why things mm. aren't happening. It, they, a, they just, they, they want things to go right. Mm. They're not interested in excuses for why things are going wrong. I mean, I think it's a, I mean, my view is it's a pathetic excuse. I mean, 13 years. Well, it might be, a legi it might be an entirely legitimate. 13 years. I mean, I mean, I mean fairness, it might, be, it, might be an, right. it might be an entirely legitimate excuse. The 13 is, years. There comes a point but, but, politically I mean, where if, it, does, sorry, it doesn't if, matter if, anymore. Yeah, Charlotte, you don't if, remember the 1980s because yeah, you're too young. The winter of discontent was quoted by the Tories. Bear in mind, that was 78, 78. Mm. That was quoted by Greg's predecessors, like Norman Tebbit, would come out with that back in 1988, 1989, yeah. 1990. So th this is not but a new thing. But if I'm mighty, no, what we're what's happening today, actually Labour have been in charge of Birmingham for 10 years. Labour have been in charge of London for the last seven years. Labour have been in charge of Wales for the last 25 years. So, so you've been in charge the, of the country for 13 yeah. years. Okay, but what I'm talking about and, and people are saying, well, but the point here is where Labour are in charge of something. Is, but, yeah, but Greg, the point is, and people are saying, look, if you're basically saying now, we've been in charge in 13 years, but we can't deal with these issues because Labour's messing no, up. No, I'm not saying... thinking, well, what's yeah. the, what, that is the point? What's the Dan, point? Dan, that is why the point. Why we vote for that? When Labour are in charge, they don't run things well. I'm making a very simple statement. And you know what else this day is? It's it's a year since Liz mm. let us trust, who, as a result of her cavalier policies, have put hundreds, if not thousands, of pounds on people's mortgage bills. I mean, I'm sorry, we are now at the point where it used to be the case, perhaps, once upon a time, when people might look at the Conservative Party and think, OK, you know, I don't like everything they do, but you can probably trust them with money. I genuinely don't think that the Conservatives, after the debacle of the last year and how people are feeling and what they are having to do to make ends meet, that people can credibly look at the Conservative Party and say that anymore. So I'm sorry, you know, but I think Dan's completely right. They've got nothing left that they've got to hark back to 13 years and that ago. Is a, that, I, mean, yeah, I, well, I disagree. Real I disagree. You, that is also out of date. I mean, what we have seen, particularly with the economic data Are being revised... Are you saying revised, that people's mortgages haven't gone with up? People, the economic data being revised is actually the UK is the best performing 
G7 countries. You're, you're so out of touch, out, no, no, that is, no, no, that's I'm sorry, last I've got week's to economic challenge you. Data. You are that is so out of touch. You're a year out of date. I'm no, talking I'm last not. week's economic revised data. And I'm data. talking about the doors I knocked Britain on last week. Britain is actually the best recovering major Greg. economy in Europe. Greg, you are so out of it. You try telling that to somebody who rings into this show day after day saying, well, OK, we may be the fastest growing economy. That's the macro side. I'm giving you the micro yeah. side. Yeah. My experience, That's my scary. mortgage has got... I mean, I'll, I'll give you my experience. Yeah, my mortgage has gone up a £1,000 a month. Hmm. Now, I, I'm lucky in that I can afford to do that. But if I was on an average salary, I would not be able yeah. to... No, I'm sorry, and I think, I'm sorry, if this whole exchange, I'm sorry, Greg, you are so You're out of a touch. Year behind, you are Labour. so out of touch. No, you You're are, you are, a out, year ago. you are on a different I'm planet. Talking about a week the experience ago. of people in this country does not bear up to what you're saying. You're some, so some sort of revision in, in past tense a very important of the, set of the economy. Well, you tell it to my constituents who contact me, who are looking at leaving their houses because they aren't able to afford their mortgage, because they are now going to food banks, because they can't afford to put food on the table for their children. I'm sorry. The Conservative Party from top to bottom has lost touch with people and reality. Mark, see what you've done. Good question. Thank you very much. Let's have some more of them in just a few moments here on Cross Question. It's 8.32, time for the news headlines with Serena Farrow. Airports and ports have been informed after a terror suspect went on the run from prison. 21-year-old Daniel Abed Khalif had been waiting trial at HMP Wandsworth in London where he escaped this morning. The Children's Commissioner has told LBC that rebuilding schools as a result of the concrete crisis will take years. It's understood government officials have been discussing the use of temporary classrooms for up to five years. And legislation that would end historical prosecutions related to the Troubles has now passed the Commons. The law change, which is opposed by every political party in Northern Ireland, offers limited immunity to some accused of murder. LBC weather mostly dry tonight with a few thundery showers in the west, some mist and fog along the coast with a low of 9 degrees. Weekdays from 7am. I am the Keir Starmer of radio. Straight to the point. If they're prepared to shoot each other to get on a boat, I don't know if they want them coming to this country. Uncompromising. They're incompetent. Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC. I've done a complete U-turn on this. Listen on your radio and on Global Player. Info. 
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 8.35, Greg Hans, Leila Moran, Dan Hodges and Charlotte Prabham with me taking your calls. Well, here's a text question from Phil in Purley who says, if successful asylum seekers are being made homeless and don't like it, does the panel think they should F off back to France? Now, normally, I wouldn't take a question with that kind of language, but I think we all know what that's referring to. Um, but th there's been a development today where refugee charities are warning that successful asylum seekers could end up homeless because the Home Office is now ordering them to leave the hotel rooms they've been put up in uh, in seven days rather than the 28 days, which has been the case up to now. Um, Charles, let's come to you first on this, because from a taxpayer point of view, you can quite see, well, the Home Office see that they can save a bit of money here. But on the other hand, I wonder how many people in just in normal life find it easy to find a property to live in after seven days? No, oh, it's impossible, isn't it? I think we all know that, how difficult it is to find somewhere to live. But if you're someone that's um, a successful asylum seeker, so has gone through the process of ultimately gaining refugee status, um, they're likely to have been through a hell of a lot. Um, who knows how they have arrived in this country, but I doubt it's been often by safe, secure means. Um, some people have had to resort to really dangerous mechanisms to get here. Um, and then once they've gone through that process, which can take years, by the way, it's not just you arrive, you fill in a form, and then here you are, you have access to the UK, you've got successful asylum, you're given benefits, you're living a life of Riley. Far from it. Um, I represented a young uh, mother uh, who came to this country as a result of she herself had undergone FGM when she was very young, but she wanted to protect her daughter from female genital mutilation. I won't say what country she came from, um, so I wouldn't want her to identify herself or anybody else that matter. And she had a horrendous uh, time going through this uh, the Home Office. Um, it, I mean, it took three years for the case to finally get to court. Um, she had to undergo a medical examination to prove that she'd had FGM, which is incredibly invasive, as you can imagine. She suffered re-traumatisation as a result of looking at her genitalia and having it documented in this way. She couldn't access legal aid. Uh, she was living on um, absolute uh, poverty you know, in, in really dire straints. Many working, not necessarily her, but others working on the black market for £1.50, £2 an hour. You know, this really is modern slavery happening in this country with women who have children and are single mothers. And so when you talk about successful asylum seekers who are being made homeless and suggesting that they should F off, you know, it just makes me question what the hell has happened to the state of our humanity when we are speaking to desperate people who are at risk of persecution in their home country and we are here providing them hopefully with a safe haven to rebuild their lives and we're telling them to F off back to France, which by the way isn't even their home country, instead of providing them with the accommodation but, I mean, the that they point, need. I mean, this is obviously referring back to Lee Anderson, the Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, who made the comment about, um, well, if they don't like living on the barge, they can F off back to France. I mean, it's a slightly different context to, to it's this. It's worse, isn't it, here? Because what we're saying is that these individuals, these people who are often desperate, they are vulnerable, they've been traumatised by the system and the process and the risk of persecution back home, have actually gone through a legitimate legal process and they are met with a hostile environment often by the Home Office and what the, what we're seeing here with this policy in my view is the nasty party is back it's saying to these individuals who do need a roof over their head otherwise where are they going to sleep they're going to be on the streets aren't they and they're going to be at further risk not only are they destitute women will be at risk of prostitution uh, others will be have no other mechanism to gain any access to resources other than modern slavery and having to work as I say on the black market in these in these ways and children even you know, asylum seekers come here often with families. What on earth are they supposed to do? Okay. They're living on the streets. And what happens? And the local authority come along exactly. and they put their children into foster care. Foster care can cost hundreds, sometimes a thousand pounds a week. So we're willing to put vulnerable refugees' children into hotels or bed and breakfast or with foster carers okay. rather than actually putting them with their family Dan in Hodges. safe homes. 
Well, it's, I mean, it's a very interesting question, actually, because I've done a lot of these programmes, and normally these programmes are about, you know, normally the question's in relation to sort of bogus asylum seekers, but this question specifically relates to somebody who is a legitimate asylum seeker, so it's a very easy question to answer. It, it, you know, we need to be absolutely clear and unequivocal about this. Where we have a situation where somebody has, has been through the process and has been granted asylum, then we have an absolute and unequivocal obligation to provide them with sanctuary from persecution. And obviously, as part of that, if we're throwing them out on the street, we're not doing that. So I think in relation to the specifics of the question, it, it, it's very clear. We have to provide proper support and proper sanctuary to those who reach our shores and who we deem to be legitimate refugees. And that's not, that's not I mean, you know, that's not a new policy. That's a, that's a policy that we've had in this country for, for for decades. If you know, going back further. But equally, I mean, I'm going to be honest. I mean, I, you know, what you said was very articulate and, and, and passionate. But I'll answer your question. You know, what does it say about us? The reason why that we know why the reason why that question was asked in that way, and it's because there are a significant number of people who who, who reach this country who are genuinely seeking asylum and there are a significant number of people who reach this country who are not genuinely seeking asylum but are economic migrants and i i, I think we you know I, I i i think we have to be honest about this we can we can all you know do our very sort of you know liberal take our, our, our liberal perspectives on this the reality is a lot of people are very concerned about the fact that there are large numbers of people coming here who are using the mic that the, the asylum system as a way of uh, uh, as an alternate route to to economic migration and i know we all hate it and we're all very nice liberals who you know you know live in london etc but we got a nice liberal who lives in Oxford sorry, sorry, here. Yeah. <laughs> nice liberals who live in Oxford. But no, no, but we have to be on we have to it, it's no good us going on programmes like this and throwing our hands up in the air and saying, Oh, why why are we we all not being more humane about this? That doesn't solve the problem. You know, we have to address okay. the problem. Okay. Right, let's and move there, there is let's a, move on to let's finish this. There is a problem of people reaching our shores who are not seeking asylum, who are not actually do not actually require asylum and we we have to deal with okay, that otherwise we won't deal point. with the broader issue so, so first of all the vast majority of people who do go through the system by the home office's own figures are genuine asylum seekers it just takes Fine. a huge amount of time Fine. to process them and actually some of the problems we're seeing is down to complete home office and government failure to tackle any of that backlog. So, I mean, I think we've got, a, again, sense of proportion. We're into that today. Um, the sense of proportion is that the vast majority of people do actually end up in this position where they get their papers, and it is not an easy process. I, not as much as Charlotte, I'm sure, but I've also s supported people through this. It is incredibly arduous, very, very difficult. So to get that paper saying, yes, you can be in this country legally, hurrah, and we have celebrated with many families as they've done it, the idea that they've then got seven days to find somewhere anywhere in my area is just a complete nonsense. And all that happens at that point, and that point about councils, we were talking about councils. Mm. Councils are already under a huge financial strain, whether they're going under or not. None of them have any spare cash. And there is a act, which the Conservatives sometimes are very proud of, called the Homelessness Reduction Act. There is now a legal duty on councils to prevent homelessness. So all that's going to happen here is that they're going to be shunted out of these hotels and fall right into the lap of local authorities. You've mentioned what happens to the children, but also let's just talk about the cost of it. Mm. It's now the cost is going to get shunted onto, a local, onto local councils who already can't afford it in the first place. Wouldn't it be better use those 28 days as they are, have a better system, deal with the backlog, have a proper plan for where they go afterwards, have the children in a school where they can immediately go, help them get into work so they start contributing to the tax the, the tax coffers, which they haven't been able to do because asylum seekers aren't allowed to work. Liberal Democrats think they should because <coughs> actually while they're here, why not? And then they're contributing as well. So uh, there are a huge number of ways you can solve this. And I'm afraid that this is, you know, one department shunting onto another. I do wonder what Michael Gove has to say about this in his uh, position as, as, you know, Minister for Local Government. We haven't got because Michael Gove here. No, I know, it's going to be his problem. Hands. 
Uh, well, look, I think I agree with Dan that actually it's a question about getting a balanced and proportionate response. Um, the UK, we're very proud of our record over many decades of uh, taking refugees from around the world. We've probably taken overall more per head than any other major Western country in recent decades. And we can be proud of that record as being a beacon where people come to. But we also have to be fair on taxpayers and have to be fair on people. Uh, the amount that we are paying at the moment for hotel accommodation is about six million pounds a day. Six million pounds a day for hotel accommodation. That is not a system that is working well. So we need to make sure that we, if you like, solve the problem at source uh, by reducing the number of people who shouldn't be coming here, particularly the number of people coming illegally into this country. And that is exactly what the government's programme has been doing with the Illegal Migration Act, uh, which has been passed, which the Liberals and Labour have fought uh, tooth and nail at every stage. But we are having some effect. Uh, the number of small boat arrivals uh, this year is down 20% on last year's. So it's still way, way too high, but we are taking action. Is it really? The it is because, down 20% I mean, if you look at the figures coming ago. through August, I mean, they're pretty massive. It's down 20% a year ago, compared to a year ago. I admit it's, all, it's still too high, but it is coming down. We've reduced the number of arrivals from Albania, which a, a year ago was the biggest source of people coming to this country, uh, which is not a country with uh, persecution. I was in Albania myself on holiday about three weeks ago. It's not a country with persecution. The number of people it arriving people. from Al represented in Albania, sex trafficking 90 victims from Albania, I've represented those in blood feuds on last at risk year of their Albania. lives who so have been actually, forcibly impregnated. It's there are people that are at risk of actually persecution a in Albania. Of that balance it's right. not, it's being not true. continue to be the beacon that Britain has always been, whilst it's being fair on tax. Broken. A six million it's pound a, a day system. hotel. But how, how can I don't it, know how you can defend it and prop it up in that way. How can it be a beacon when your deputy Lee Anderson made this f off comment? I mean, what, what did you say to him after that? Did you? Uh, well, I, 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 I can't say, imagine that you supported that. No, I, I, I said to him, actually, it was inappropriate to use uh, swearing in this context and in relation to that particular issue, or indeed to any issue. I don't believe Did he then tell you to F I, off? I, I don't no, he didn't, actually. <laughs> I don't believe in using swearing in any context, I'll be quite frank with you. So I would say to any of my deputies, if they used a word like that, that is inappropriate to use in any broadcasting format. So wh why specific... did Number 10 back him up then? Well, uh, did Number 10 back yes, him up? Yes, they did. Well, they sent out a cabinet minister, Alex Chalk, on all the different... He was on LBC, he was on the BBC, uh, saying, well, yes, he, he, his point of view is, represents a lot of people in this country, and therefore he was entitled to make that point. Well, I was clear that it was, it was not the right thing to use a, a language like the F word uh, on, on, in, a, in a public forum like that. OK. Right. We'll move on in just a moment. Thank you very much indeed. Alex Chalk, uh, my colleague, tells me, described the language as robust and salty on mm. LBC. I think we can probably all agree that it was both of those things and a little bit more. Uh, it's a 48. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. One year ago, the reputation of the nation's biggest police force lay in tatters. You can't look me in the eye and say there's not another Wayne Cousins in the force. I can't look you in the eye and say that we haven't got officers who are treating women appallingly, absolutely not. Sir Mark Rowley was willing to step forward to lead the Met into a new era. I speak to a lot of frontline men and women and they're really fed up. Now it's your chance to put your questions to the Met Commissioner when Call the Commissioner returns with me, Nick Ferrari, exclusively here on LBC, Friday morning morning from 7. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC.
Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. It's 8.51 on LBC. Let's go to our next question and it'll be answered by Greg Hans, Leila Moran, Dan Hodges and Charlotte Proudman. It's from Ken in Ilchester in Somerset. Hello, Ken. Uh, hello, the brilliant show. Uh, what I would say is there's 50 million been donated by a healthcare company to the Tory party today. How much? 50 million. I think it's 5 million. Oh, is it five million? Oh, sorry. No, it's even a bit five of a difference. Million. Should they the yeah, there is falling. a difference. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but there's still a lot of money 50 anyway. Fifty million in the coffers there. Yeah, all right, all right. It's five million. But shouldn't they redirect that money to the people who have had to pay for health care that the Tories have underfunded for the last thirteen years? Um, Greg Hands. <laughs> it is five million, not fifty million. Isn't I believe it? it's it's five million. Well, all. Donations to all political parties are made in accordance with the with the law and are declared properly, uh, and that is quite right. And people can see transparently who mm. funds uh, the Conservative Party, who funds the Liberal Democrats, who funds uh, Labour, um, and I think that is entirely proper. And we have declared or will declare the the, the, the donation in the usual way and the proper way, and so people can see you know see it at face value. What do you think a private healthcare entrepreneur wants in return for that donation? Because well, I, I, a lot of our listeners accuse the government of wanting to privatise the health service, and they say, well, the Tory party is in hock to private healthcare companies. And on the face of it, you can understand why they would say this with this kind of donation. Well, look, I mean, I think that, to be fair, I think there have been private healthcare donors or people involved in private health care to, to all the, the political parties in this country. Uh, I don't assume that because somebody is involved in a particular business, uh, I, 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 as it happens, I, I don't think I've met the individual in question. So I don't know his motivations for giving to the Conservative Party. You haven't party. even said thank you. Well, uh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think in terms of why people give money to political parties, uh, you're assuming, or the questioner is assuming, that it's somehow related to their business activity. That is not always the case. It may be somebody who is actually involved in business. Many business people uh, don't like the idea of there being a Labour government or a future Labour Lib Dem coalition, and therefore give money to the Conservative okay. Is it an individual Layla. or a company? Just it's, an, it's an individual it's that's an given individual. it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, it doesn't look good does it? Because I think your question's exactly right, Ian. Why are they deciding to spend this well, much I mean, money? Let's face it, your party have had a few issues on this type of thing. In the well, on, well. On, but on the NHS, I think well, uh, Somerset's a lovely part of the country, by the way. We've had a, a, a new Somerset MP this oh. week, Sarah Dyke. Gratuitous. Absolutely. No, she's <laughs> wonderful. And I spent the... the the door knocking and uh, some of that was come on, stunning. We're near, we're near the end of the programme. On, though, so on, get, on, on, the, on the doors, top of that list was they could not get a GP appointment for love nor money and they were seriously worried about the NHS. The point, the caller, I think, is the wider point, is people <coughs> look at the Conservative Party, they're looking at the NHS, they're looking at the size of donation and maybe two and two is five, or maybe not. Right. If we can have brief answers from both of you, we can squeeze in one yeah. more question. Charlotte. Uh, can I agree with you? Uh, I think you should consider running as an MP. Should do it. I think it's a great wow. policy. Nobody's ever said that to a cross question caller before. Uh, Dan? Uh, it's a company we're still having this debate. Uh, we have it every year. It's ridiculous. We should have state funding of political parties, but people don't want state funding. So I'll have this system. People will give parties in their own, give money to parties in their own interests, not in the national interest. But if that's the system we want, that's the system we've, we will we'll have. OK, Ken, thank you very much. Uh, next question, it's a text question from Wayne in Skegness. Isn't it refreshing to hear an MP speaking up about the issues men face in modern society and wanting to do something about it? Now, this is Conservative MP Nick Fletcher. He's called for the creation of a minister for men to address issues like male suicide, paternity rights and misogyny. We're going to be talking about this for the entire next hour. Um, unfortunately, Nick Fletcher can't join us because he's got something else on, but um, I'm sure we'll make the best of it. Now, Charlotte, there is a minister for women. Why shouldn't there be a minister for men? Well, I think it's interesting that it's Nick Fletcher MP that's come up with this proposal because you might remember back in, I think it was 2021 now, he suggested that having a female Doctor Who uh, was resulting in crime going up. I do remember, do remember that. that? Now I you've think we it. actually may have even I spoken think we may about have that. Done. Um, I mean, look, uh, we have more uh, male MPs than we do women, and very often those men that are sitting... Not if you're Labour. Well, the, across the board, 
across the board you do still sadly and when it comes to developing policies it's largely I'm afraid to say white privileged men that are still creating those policies and it's often from their perspective rather than from women's uh, viewpoints but, there, but to be serious here there is an issue about male suicide isn't there mm. uh, particularly course, among th young th men absolutely. so wh why shouldn't there be a minister looking after men's interests well, as well as one looking after women's interests Largely, when we're thinking about mental health policy, it is from the perspective of men. It is often gendered in that way. It doesn't include the perspective of women, which still remain, unfortunately, a largely oppressed, um, even though they're a majority within our population. And so that's why we have a women's minister to address and, well, I say redress some of those gender inequalities across the board, looking at all policies. So yes, I think it's important to address the rise in misogyny, uh, address violence against women and girls starting in schools, going through to universities, going through to the workplace, uh, rising uh, rates of rape and sexual assault. It's not just a women's issue, it's also a men's issue. It's largely men that perpetrate that, but not exclusively. Uh, so of course, but I don't think we need a men's minister to do okay. that. Okay, Dan? Uh, yeah, I'm quite surprised about that, actually. I mean, uh, you know... Uh, you know, we, we, we hear about the culture wars and, and I think there's a perception the culture war tends to come from the right rather than the left. I mean, I, I generally don't see what... I don't, I, don't, I don't see what the problem is. I mean, the, the statistics are there in relation to male suicide. There are particular issues that, 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 that uh, affect men, affect boys. I think if we have... I think if we have those ad issues addressed in an effective way, everybody benefits from that, men and women... I, I, I don't actually see They're what the already problem is. 30 actually seconds see each, if I may, Leila. I think, actually, the, the core of what he's talking about, particularly misogyny, young boys, I've, a lot of parents and teachers are very worried about the effect of various online influences on, on young men at the moment. We clearly do have a problem, and there is a mental health crisis in this country, particularly in our children. Rather than this, because... The fact is, the answer to the question is, yes, there's a women's minister and the men's ministers are all the other ministers because that has been the perspective that has pervaded yeah. Parliament for a very long time and we need a champion for those okay. issues. Yeah. But we need cabinet-level mental health minister. That's what I would prefer. Yeah. And I think we need relationship and sex education in schools all the way up to 18 so that actually men, boys and girls, men and women, get equal okay, treatment. Great. Yes. Well, it's a, I mean, very, very serious issues being raised here. Um, and uh, I undoubtedly think that there are issues that affect men uh, 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 as much or sometimes more than women, like, for example, suicide, as you rightly pointed out. However, we already have uh, a, a minister for women and equality, and we have a whole team. It's actually not right to say that they're all women. In fact, Mike Freer is a minister for equality working in Kemi Badnock's team. There is a whole team. They answer questions in the House of Commons once every five weeks as well. Uh, and they are available to question, and those include men in that team. So Kemi is in charge of that team, which is of both men and women. Can right. I just say, just, very, very, just very, very briefly, on the point about suicide rates, of course, it's a serious issue. It's one that needs to be addressed. But when you look at the high rates of female suicides, um, a good number of those, and we don't exactly know how many because it's very difficult to count, stem, to hang on, stem, stem from domestic um, abuse perpetrated well, by that, men That is, that is true, women. but when the biggest killer of men under 45 is suicide, then, I think it's an issue that does need to be it, taken it, very it seriously. It is, it is, but across right. the board. Um, let's, let's lighten the mood a bit with our fun question question uh, from Ben in, Benny in Cardiff. The Rolling Stones are back with a new album. Andrew Marvel's getting very excited about this earlier. Um, <laughs> which legendary act, living or dead, would you love to see making a comeback next? Layla. I hate questions like this. because Well, I've given you back. 10 minutes I know he did. He gave answer. us a plan. Actually, you know what? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of Whitney Houston at the moment. You did say dead. And I, what a legend. And what I wouldn't give to see her in concert because I'm old enough now. Didn't we almost have it all? Greg? <laughs> well, I'm a massive fan of Duran Duran, who do still tour. So that can't be my answer. This was no. not an answer I was expecting. <laughs> I would say... I would say, actually, I'm going to give the honest answer, which is not maybe a trendy answer. I would actually say, which would get the most public interest, would be the Beatles coming back 
uh, obviously, uh, if I'm correct, two of them are still alive. But uh, reunite, I think, would have the biggest public interest. I think millions of people. Would well, I would have said ABBA, but of course they have made a comeback. Uh, oh, Dan, uh, I'd actually, I'd actually say Oasis. Let's let's get the let's oh, get the whole Noel really? Liam psychodrama <laughs> down oh, with one. Part, let's That's park right. it once and for all. In fact, let's, let's just all go back on. to the nineties. <laughs> let's yeah. just go and stay Come there. Back, <laughs> <Charlotte>. <laughs> I was going to say ABBA. Um, Freddie Mercury. Oh yeah, Queen. Queen yes. Well, Queen yes. do. That's the, obviously still Thank exist. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed for that, Greg Hans, Leila Moran, Dan Hodges and Dr Charlotte Proudman. Coming up on Monday's panel will be, this is a juicy one, Emily Thornbury, sorry I've called you uh, juicy Emily, um, Sarah Vine, oh, wow. Jonathan Gullis MP yes. and David Aronovich. <laughs> you won't want to miss that one, I can assure you. But coming up in a moment, we are going to talk about the subject of a minister for men. Do we really need 